All right, all right, all right. Amazing hackers. Playtime is over. Now we're going to get into the real stuff. Whatever I taught you about cross-site scripting, it was just a basic. Because now we're going to get into the real stuff. When I was talking about cross-site scripting before, I was mostly talking about passive testing, seeing how we can test for cross-site scripting without doing too much effort. Well, guys, this is going to be hardcore, so buckle up and let's get into it, shall we? Reflected cross-site scripting, you may know what it is. It may sound very, very simple at its core, but it's not, I promise you. We'll look into that and we'll look at some test objectives as well and then we'll look into how to test. Basically, we'll mostly look at black box testing because gray box testing and also partly white box testing is very similar um, and bypassing cross-site scripting filters is something that we've went over in a different chapter as well so if you guys are interested in that there will be one in the link below so just scroll down a little bit you should see a chapter on bypassing cross-site scripting filters as for tools we'll also talk a little bit about that and it's not your usual tools that you know like xss strike okay that's a good tool but we're going to talk about some cool tools there and then the references that were used for this guide so Let's talk about what we have in reflected cross-site scripting, shall we? When we talk about reflected cross-site scripting, a few requirements have to be met. If this is not true, then we're not talking about cross-site scripting. It's really, really important that the attacker can inject browser executable code within a single HTTP response. That means that if the attacker inserts is a tag string and he has to execute a different uh, HTTP request to get that attack string, then it's no longer a reflected cross-site scripting. Then we're talking more about stored. So as I said, this is not a attack factor that's stored within the application. It's not persistent at all. This only affects the users who click on a malicious link or who visit a malicious website, of course, because this is not just clicking that is affected. Um, some of the attack factors, they always belong to the URI or to the HTTP. HTTP parameters, this is really important to remember. Uh, and also really important to remember is that whatever the attacker inputs, it's not processed properly, which we mean by that it's not filtered, it's not sanitized, and then it's returned to the victim in that state. Now, XSS reflected is the most common type of cross-site scripting that you'll find out there. It's referred to as first order or type one cross-site scripting by the OWASP testing guide. Uh, and the application will basically pass that unsanitized input, very important here, onto the victim. Now, the modus operandi for reflected cross-site scripting would be to start with a design step in which the attacker creates and tests an offending URI. Then he's going to do social engineering steps to get the victim to click on the URI or to visit the specific website that is infected. And then the eventual execution of the payload is going to happen on the, on the victim's browser, which will give the attacker what he wants, of course. As bug bounty hunters, we are going to stop at the design step as penetration testers as well, unless it's specifically in our assignments to also do social engineering steps. Now for proper character encoding, it's really the biggest challenge to protect against cross-site scripting. It's really, really important that the developers have encoded every single possible character that could be a problem. And if they forgot one, that's going to be a big issue. For example, the script tag here might be filtered out, but this script tag might not be. And if you look carefully, of course, this percent three C and percent three E are just the less than and greater than signs. But if the filter doesn't specifically check for those, and if the web page renders them as less than and greater than signs, we might still have a cross-site scripting on our hands. As for the test objectives, we really want our testers to identify where a value is reflected into the response that we get. Really important here, the value gets reflected into the response. This means that they can assess the input 
and they can accept and see if they can pass around any filters so they can look at for example if the filter is going to block the less than sign they might try to get around it using the ampersand lt point comma encoding i have a whole chapter on bypassing those filters by the way so if you're interested in that go check it out um, but that's what we will do. We're going to identify where our value gets reflected. That will be our sync into the document. And then we're going to see in that response if we can get around any filters that are in place, if they are at all, of course. Um, we are going to test for it in several ways. Of course, you can test for black box, which means that you don't have access to any source code. You're just going in blind and you're going to test a lot. This is quite important and annoying, but you really have to do it. You're going to try and detect every single input factor. And this is really important that you take your notes well. Note down every single one of these because you will easily forget one of them. And if you're on a professional pen test, it doesn't look good if you're forgetting parameters. Uh, if you're a bug bounty hunter, it's not a good idea either. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to define all of those user controlled variables and parameters. And we're going to also include the non-obvious ones such as HTTP parameters, post parameters, post data, hidden fields, predefined radio buttons, selection values, those are all possibilities for reflected cross-site scripting, guys. So keep those in mind as you're testing it. Now you're going to, when you're testing it, analyze your input factor. And then you're going to craft a input factor specifically designed for every single parameter. Now where these parameters reflect their value into what context, HTML, HTML tag attribute, JavaScript, that's going to determine what your attack factor is going to be like. So an example for the HTML tag attribute would be this, because we're going to try and end the tag attribute with the double quote and then the less than sign, and then we're going to try to insert our own script in there. Now we can also try the single quote, of course. We can try many different things here. We can try encoding these values so again, you have to use your imagination and try a lot of things here. You can manually test for those or use a fuzzer. It really depends on you. I'd recommend that you start manually and then as you get the hang of it, you might have an idea of how to program your fuzzer better. Um, as for the HTML context, I have, for example, a broken image. There's also the JavaScript context, but you guys can look at the cross-site scripting filter revision cheat sheet provided by OWASP or the chapter in this course. Now we're going to, if we have those input factors analyzed, if we have all of them noted down, we're going to check for any impact. So if any of those attack factors that we inserted in our previous step is going to catch, then the tester will judge the impact realistically. This is very important as a tester. You have to be very realistic in your judgment of impact. If you cannot steal cookies, if there's nothing to be done on that page, if there's no real reflection, then of course there is no impact and you have to move on. I know it's annoying and especially if you've been testing about 200 parameters, but it's a good property of a personal property of a tester in my opinion that they are diligent and that they can follow things to a T. So that's very, very important. What we're going to do is we're going to look for where those values are reflected. That's of course important. We're going to define our special characters that are not properly encoded. A little bit more about that later, replaced or filtered. Sometimes, again, developers like to use blacklist-based filtering and they might forget to filter or replace or encode a value. And that might be our entry point. Um, those codings depend on the context. For example, if you're testing an HTML context, these are some key HTML elements that you should always test for. You should test for these entities and see if they get reflected properly into the uh, response. Um, they cannot be encoded, they cannot be filtered, 
they cannot be left out, they cannot be replaced by anything. Um, you can also check out this full list provided to us on Wikipedia. It's really, really useful to look at it. Um, but that's a little bit outside of the scope of this course, of course. Now what we're going to do is if we are in the JavaScript context, we're going to have to look for a totally different set of characters. And it's going to be this one because every single one of these characters is going to either allow us to break out of the JavaScript context that we are in or craft an attack string based on these characters. So again, these are a very limited list of them, but these should be the major ones. And you can always check out the full list for yourself. Now the filtering again, we have a section about that in this course. Uh, and then we also have gray box testing, which is a little bit similar to black box testing, but it's not exactly the same. The pen tester has partial knowledge of the application, for example, some JavaScript files or something, but never full source code review. Uh, and then the tester, of course, can craft their payloads a little bit better because they might already know which values are being filtered. Imagine if your filter is a JavaScript filter, well, then it's easy to kind of extrapolate those uh, filterings and see how you can get around them. Um, it's also very, very important that you know about what tools you can use, of course, because you can do this manually, but there are some tools available which might help you quite a lot. The first one we're going to talk about is PHP Care Set Encoder. This one will help you encode your arbitrary text to and from 65 kinds of characters. What this basically means is you enter your text and you can say um, to, uh, to car array, I think it was, and then it will put them, uh, put every single character of your text. It will put that into a character array, of course. There, there's JSONify. There's many different things that you can do. Um, Hackverter is an online tool which allows many types of encoding and obfuscation of JavaScript. Uh, I haven't used this a lot yet. I will probably, when I want to, for example, base64 encode something, I'll just look up base64 encoder on Google, but it might be useful to have all of these things in one place and hack vector can do that for you. And then you have XSS proxy, which is an advanced cross-site scripting attack tool. It's basically a proxy that goes in between the attacker and the target and is going to analyze the requests. Red proxy as well, it's a semi-automated largely passive web application security audit tool means again that this it's basically just a scanner that's going to statically analyze any JavaScript files uh, and it's going to do some uh, semi-automated annotation. It's going to look for potential security problems. The cool thing is that it's pattern based um, and it's going to look for different patterns that look like vulnerabilities. It's going to mark them for you and you're going to have to go through them yourself, of course. Then you have your proxies on your man in the middle proxies, I should say as well, of course. You have burp and OWASP SAP. In practice, I haven't found a really big difference between them, to be honest. You can use either one, you can use both in conjunction. It doesn't really matter that much, especially not for cross-site scripting. And then as for the references, really important to know, we used the community edition of the cheat sheet for cross-site scripting filter evasion. We used the community edition of the, what's, what's it called again? Sorry, I forgot the name, web security testing guide. That was it, version 4.2. Then we have a white paper that was also in the web security testing guide. We have a cross-site scripting FAQ from CGI security. We have some papers uh, on the matter and we also have another publication. So if you guys are interested in that, you can look a little bit further into cross-site scripting. This was reflected cross-site scripting, stored cross-site scripting coming up next. Thank you very much. Amazing hackers. See you soon. Bye.